right, welcome to Way to Go Wednesday, where I introduce you to my writing friends and their newly released books. And today I'm going to be meeting with children's author Susanna Berman Deaver. And we're going to be talking about her new book, Predator and Prey. Welcome, Susanna. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, it's so nice to talk to you. I can't wait to hear about this book because it's so unique, it's science related and it's poetry and all the fun things that have to do with both of those those are both my favorite things so oh, good <laughs> yay so the kids always want to know and teachers want to know what inspired you to write this answer, book but um back in my previous okay. life i was a scientist and i actually what i studied was animal behavior and what animal behavior is and we're trying to figure out why animals are doing what they are doing out in the wild. So there's usually a reason they're doing it. It's, it's helping them survive for some. I spent a lot of years in my youth kind of following animals around out in the wild and trying to figure out why they were doing what they did. And as part of that, I had learned a lot about different strategies animals use and especially animal communication, which is how animals talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Because I felt like that was a great way to kind of see the world through an animal's eyes. If we know what they're talking about, we know what's important to them. I always wanted to know what it was like to be an animal and really like what they feel. I did that for many years and um, I still love animal behavior even though I'm not a working scientist right now. I was just thinking about things that I love. I love animals and I love animal communication, but after becoming a mom, I was getting into children's books and ways to make science fun because I'm a real science nerd. And one day I dropped my kids off at preschool, I was running through my head different things about animals, specifically thinking about chickadees and how they use different types of calls in different situations to defend themselves against predators. And the first line of a poem kind of popped into my head. And then what a hawk would say in response to that also kind of popped into my head. And I thought, oh, well, maybe this could be something to play around with. And then years and years later, I had the manuscript for my book, but that's kind of where it all came from. How many years did it take you? Probably writing the manuscript overall took about two to three years because I'd work on some poems kind of off and on. And some of them, you know, my first drafts were terrible. So I had to just kind of <laughs> shelve them. And then there was a question of finding enough, make a whole arc through the book of different types of examples of different things that animals would do. So I kind of got the idea to have examples where sometimes the prey is lying to the predator to get out of a dangerous situations. But then there's times where a predator is lying to the prey to lure them into a trap. But then there's times the prey is actually honest to the predator, either saying, I see you, don't attack me because I know you're there. Or it's honestly saying, I'm poisonous, don't even bother trying to eat me. So trying to find enough varied examples to kind of tell all the different stories that are going on, that took quite a bit of research. Circle back to your original question. It probably took me two to three years of research and revision until I felt like I had something that was good enough. And that included a lot of periods of times where I could just kind of shelve it for a little while because I'll write something and then I kind of have to let it rest. I think all writers use that strategy at some point too. I used to call it marinating in school. They're brain and holding on to this, these ingredients, and somehow it's all going to be put together in something wonderful. And that's yeah. what happened with your book. Oh my gosh, it's absolutely beautiful. Well, thank you. I love revision. I love marinating time. I sometimes joke that I'm the world's slowest writer because I feel like I need to give it time. And I feel lucky that I can afford to give it the time. Otherwise, I'm not as happy with what I wrote. I second guess everything all the time. I'm terrible at that. I mean, that's just one personality trait. <laughs> so... <laughs> I think that's a writer's personality trait, yeah. <laughs> second guessing ourselves. Yeah, so, I think so. Do you know how many revisions total you went through? I can't even count because I revise as I write, especially with poetry. It takes me a long time and I revise as I write and I am stuck 
a lot. And sometimes even with revisions, I feel like I'm writing the same lines over and over again and in the hope that something good is going to magically pop into my head at some point. So you'll spend all day rewriting one line? Sometimes. I'm embarrassed to admit. And then, you know, you look at your, your, well, your progress for the rest of the day and you think, wow, that was a day working on the one line. And then the next day you go back and say, you know what, that line is terrible. I can't believe I spent all day. Oh, no. But, you know, I think that's all part of my process. I need to let things cook in the back of my head. I find uh -huh. taking a walk is great. If I've been working on something, let's say I have one line that I like, but I need to think of other things that go with it. I'll have like a certain meter stuck in my head. I'll go for a walk. Maybe when I'm done with the walk, I'll come in and I'll, you know, take whatever scrap paper I can and just start jotting things down and hopefully some of that will be good. So I tend to rewrite the same poem hundreds of times with little variations or I'll brainstorm a series of lines that might go with the meter that I'm working with. Another thing with these particular poems is I have to make sure that my facts are right. So that's an extra challenge when you're trying to use poetry to tell facts. So can you describe the, the layout of your book? Because you have poetry based on facts with each of the characters, which would be the animals, the predator and the prey. Mm -hmm. You also have sidebars in there. Sure. The idea for this format arose from reading Paul Fleischman's Joyful Noise, the, the poems for two voices. And I hadn't been exposed to poems for two voices before. And I thought, oh, yeah, that could be a really cool way to explore this particular idea because you have animals that are facing off and they each have different goals. And so the way it works in the book is that on each spread, you have a predator and prey pair. And the prey is using its voice to say what its goal in this situation and the predator has a poem saying its goal in the situation so for example the first poem in the book where you have the spider facing off against an assassin bug it's a poem for two voices where they're both saying the spider is saying i'm here to hunt i'm going to kill and the assassin bug is saying i'm going to lure you into my trap and so oh they talk to each other that way and then for each poem, either poem pair, there is a little nonfiction sidebar that explains what's really going on between these two. I want you to kind of imagine what it's like to be the animal and then read about what's going on. So, so it's, it's two ways to present the same information. I always find that, think that it's kind of fun if you can be engaged by rhythm or rhyme, pretending to be the animal, to reading about what's going on. Are, were you aware of all of these animals when you started writing or did you end up finding some new ones as you did your research? A lot of them I knew of ahead of time simply because of my background with studying animal communication and animal behavior. So they were examples that I had known. None of these animals were actually my research subjects. Learning about it in grad school, just I was aware of a, a bunch of these. I found some new ones through additional research, like the animal lizard doing push-ups to talk to the snake. I had known about prey talking to predators, but that particular one I found and I thought that that was kind of a fun one. I, I just think it's really fun to think about these very complicated and complex lives that are going on all around us all the time that we just, we go through our daily lives and we don't think about the natural world around us. I'm, I'm not a birder by any stretch, but when I do go out and bird and I see the birds, and I see the great variety of birds, or if I'm out in my garden and I see all the different types of insects that have come to my garden, just seeing the diversity of life out there that we just stop and take a minute to appreciate it and look at it. Just this world is an amazing place and it's just such a wonderful take the time look and watch and, and just realize that you know everything's much bigger than us whatever's going on in the world is so much bigger than us. So do you have a favorite predator-prey relationship that you wrote about? You're so proud <laughs> of all of them. <laughs> They're all my babies. No, yeah. um, I think my favorite poem is probably the first one with the spiders and the assassin bugs because when I felt like I got that one, I was like, oh yeah, I think I got this one. I still am very shy about considering myself either a poet or that I'm any good at any of this, but I do like that one. And another poem that I particularly like, it's about the chickadee using the seat alarm call, which is the really short alarm call. And even though that poem is the shortest poem in the book, that's the one that actually took me the longest to write because I had written this much longer poem, but it was way too long for the little call. So you think that the poem should be a short little 
poem to go with the short little call. You wanted it to match the meter and you wanted the length of the poem to match the communication of that particular animal. Which is maybe why it takes me an entire day to write a line and then decide I hate that line. But yeah, the animal lizard poem, I wanted it to be like a braggy cheer. And when I came up with that one, I was just doing dishes. And then I'm buff, I'm tough, you know I've got the stuff. And I'm like, oh, okay, I can use that, you know, and the whole, <laughs> and the rest of it kind of kind of came from there. Trying to kind of put yourself into the voice of the animal was, was a very fun part of it. It took a lot of work. <laughs> So in the last part, do you have any advice for future writers or readers, what you would like for them to get out of reading your book? I guess for, for readers of the book, what I hope they get out of it is a recognition of the wonder of the natural world and how it is all so, so much more complicated and complex and amazing. If you just stop and take a look and there's just so much really cool, complicated stuff out there. And sometimes you can feel like, well, I'll never understand it all because it's complicated. And to me, that's part of the excitement of it because there's just so much going on and there's always more that you can learn about the world. And I guess if, if anybody is interested in writing, I would say take time to really work on something. By taking my time with this, I came up with something much better than if I had just somehow managed to get it published. The, the weaker poems got pruned out and at the end, I felt much happier. I'll never be 100% happy with anything that I do. That's just my nature. Allow yourself some time and some breathing space. I, I do my worst work when I'm putting pressure on myself and I do my best work when I'm giving myself space and time to both play and go back and work more on it. And even if I never want to see what I've written again, because it's terrible, if I give myself a little bit of breathing room, then I can go back and work on it. And you made a good point. If you're having fun and you're playing with words, then the readers are going to have a wonderful time reading it because they can feel those emotions that you're putting forth into the writing. Well, that's the hope. So, <laughs> Well, thank you, Susanna, for talking about your brand new book, Predator and Prey. Do you have anything else that you're working on now? Soon. I do have another picture book that's coming out in the spring, and that's about the sea otters and kelp forests, what happened when they were overhunted during the, the Northern Pacific International Fur Trade, which was a very devastating time. That one is actually um, a straight prose book with, with sidebars. I well, Susanna, I have to say, way to go on your new release, Predator and Prey, and I look forward to the new book in the spring. Thank you. Great job.